What a night that was when our Savior was born. What a blessing. God with us. Emmanuel came and he tabernacled amongst us. And as scripture says, he was full of grace and truth. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Beginning in the first verse of that chapter. Matthew chapter 2. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> The Bible says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, <clears throat> behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. <clears throat> and they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of, Ju of, of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, <clears throat> they went their way. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. <laughs> and they fell down and worshiped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they, they, departed, their, to their, they departed for their own country by another way. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with great hearts of joy. <laughs> As we think about the truths of this passage, they came and worshiped him. <laughs> they bowed to the king of kings as a baby. <laughs> Lord God, what a reminder of who Christ truly is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. <clears throat> and even in his mother's arms, he was yet controlling the universe. What a God. We give you praise today, Heavenly Father, for Christ, our brother, our joint heir, our Lord and Savior, our Master. We pray that you would speak to us through your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> By the grace of God, we 
we find ourselves yet again at another Christmas time. <clears throat> and, has been my, and as has been my pattern over the, my 24 years of ministry here as your pastor, we return yet again to the consideration of the coming of our Savior. The first eight years of our Christmas series were spent together studying the rich and detailed Old Testament prophecies regarding Jesus' coming. The birth of Christ was no accident, but was the fulfillment of centuries-old prophetic declarations scattered throughout the Old Testament. In 2006, we moved from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we've spent the last 16 years immersed in the two Gospels that actually contain a birth narrative of our Savior, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Given the sheer size difference between Luke's birth narrative and Matthew's birth narrative, we spent most of our time over these last few years in the Gospel of Luke. But this morning we return again to the Gospel of Matthew. Throughout our New Testament study of the birth of the Messiah, we've been following 10 facts, 10 facts that grow out of the birth narratives found in these two Gospels. Let me remind you of these 10 critical events to the birth of Christ. Number one, the promise of the birth of John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. Number two, the Annunciation, of course, to Mary, Chap Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Number three, <clears throat> Mary's visit to Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Event number four, the birth of John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 80. Number five, the genealogy of Jesus, Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 28, and Luke chapter 1, verses 2 through 17. Number six, the birth of Jesus, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Number seven, the adoration of the infant Jesus, Luke chapter 2, verses 28, 2 verses 8 through 20, and Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. Number eight, the circumcision and presentation in the temple, Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 38. Number nine, <clears throat> the flight into Egypt and return, Matthew 2, verses 13 through 21. And then number 10, the childhood of Jesus at Nazareth, Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 40, and Matthew chapter 2, 22 through 23. Now our focus this year will be on Matthew 2 verses 1 through 12. This event is a little bit of a challenge to really place it. First off, because it deals with adoration, the seventh event I just listed, the obvious comparison would be to the shepherds. However, as we'll see this year, the coming of the Magi happened after Jesus' circumcision. What this means then is that although we turn to the subject matter of adoration once again this year, this event took place after the event we completed last year, the, the circumcision and the presentation in the temple. With that in mind, let me again read for you the events of Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, the adoration, the adoration of Jesus. Listen again as I read this text for you. <clears throat> now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And, and when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together 
all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and uh, worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Although this is a well-known story, I, I think many of us probably have not considered it very carefully nor the implications of its appearance here in the Gospel of Matthew. By just reading through the story, as we have, there are several important ideas that rise to the surface that we can just skim off the top for our spiritual nurture. Consider these first to help us understand just how important this particular text is in the story of who Jesus is. I would like to highlight first for you the fact that we will see that the proper response to the Messiah is worship. (laughs) The proper response to the Messiah is worship. Although we know well that the Magi had gifts, the gifts were not the point. (laughs) In spite of how the world views these men, they actually traveled not to present their gifts, they traveled to worship the king. The gifts were simply a consequence of the fact that they were seeing a king. Within this account, even Herod, whose plan was to deceive the Magi and kill the king, even Herod knew that the proper response to the appearance of Christ was to worship him. Surprisingly, (laughs) Herod had a little more sense than many Christians today who would skip God's divine prescription for worship, which is gathering with the saints to supposedly celebrate the birth at home. (laughs) Over the last three weeks, I've brought to your attention that although Christmas falls on Sunday this year, no true Christian would ever consider bypassing the gathered worship for some sort of home celebration. Proper worship, saints, takes place within the gathered community, and the proper response to the Messiah is worship. They go hand in hand. Again, even Herod, unconverted as he was, realized the proper response to Jesus' birth was to worship. We also see in just a surface reading of this text that there will be... that there will be conflicting responses to the Messiah. You hear me? Not everybody who hears about Jesus loves Jesus. (laughs) Clearly, in this text, Matthew is contrasting the response of the Magi and the response of Herod. Even the response of the religious leadership was different than Herod's and the Magi's as well. In other words, while there's multiple ways to reject Jesus, there's only one way to receive Jesus, by faith. 
what would come to define Jesus' earthly ministry did not begin after he turned 30 and started his public ministry. Even in his birth, it became clear that there would be no middle ground with Jesus. Either one will reject him or they will accept him. There will be no fence sitting when it came to Christ. <laughs> he's embraced or he's rejected. Along these lines, I would like for you to make note of something else this morning regarding the rejection of Christ. Herod is prototypical of the response of kings and rulers to God's Messiah. Do you hear me? Herod is prototypical to the response of kings and rulers to God's Messiah. In Psalm 2, the psalmist opened his psalm regarding the reign of the Lord's anointed with these words in Psalm, 1, in psalm 2, verses 1 through 4. He wrote, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away the cords from us. <laughs> he who sits in heaven laughs. <laughs> the Lord scoffs at them. <laughs> Church, even in the birth, even in Jesus' birth, we see that he did not come, listen church, to be assimilated into the governmental systems of men. He came to displace them. This is what, un this is what unsettled Herod. And this is what continues today to unsettle the ruling class as it relates to Christianity when it is truly lived out in its biblical distinctives. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 through 8? But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden, wis the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom, listen church, which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In the Revelation, John saw the future, and look at what John saw and heard in Revelation 11, verses 15 through 17. And the seventh angel sounded, and there arose loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign, how long? Forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. And what did they say? Saying, we give thee thanks, O Lord God, the, the Almighty, who art and who wast, because thou hast taken thy great power and has begun to reign. Here in... Here in our passage this morning, we see that Jesus was born a king, and that fact unsettled the rulers of this world, for their time is short. The ruling class responded to him in fear and rejection. I remind you what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29 says. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble ruling class, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things which are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. Jesus unsettles the ruling class of this world. But there's more here, church, laying on the surface, waiting for us to grab and eat it. Who are the magi? <laughs> Who are the magi? Well, we're going to define them in just a moment when we begin our study of this text. But in a simple 
perspective, the Magi are Gentiles. Do you see something exciting here? Right at the beginning of the Jesus story, God himself brought these wisest of men among the Gentile people. And what did these wise men want to do? They wanted to worship Jesus. (laughs) How can this be? How can this be? Especially when in the same account, we see the Jews, his own people, unconcerned about him. They could tell you where he was born. Oh yeah, he's gonna be born in Bethlehem. Did they go? Did they even make an inclination like they wanted to go? Oh, they, they could care less about Jesus. But these Gentiles, these Gentiles, <laughs> church, I'm reminded, I'm reminded of an incident <laughs> at the conclusion of Jesus' earthly ministry when he was on the verge of being rejected by his own. Jesus would near the end of John chapter 12 be moved to speak of his death and resurrection. And in the same text, in the same passage, God the Father would speak to Jesus from heaven itself. Audibly, where people in the crowd heard God talking. Now, What is it that triggered Jesus? And what is it that triggered the Father to speak from heaven? Why did this take place? Hmm. Listen to what triggered Jesus in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 22. (laughs) Now, there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These, therefore, came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and and began asking him, listen to what they asked him. Listen to what these Greeks asked Philip. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. (laughs) Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Verse 22, Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. And right after that, Jesus speaks of his death and his resurrection. Why? Because those things would trigger the Gentiles coming in. That would open up access for us. Hmm. Church, we see here at the beginning, not of Jesus' public ministry. No, 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 no. Further back than that, we see here at the very beginning of his incarnation that God had something more for Jesus beyond the Jews in mind. God had people like me and like you in mind. Gentiles, those far removed from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants, those who were without hope in the world. Remember, church, the heavenly hosts sang to the shepherds in the field at night in Luke 2. And remember what they sang about to the shepherds. They sang about peace. And not just peace among the Jewish people. Peace on earth. (laughs) Were we Gentiles not on the earth? Were we Gentiles not devoid of peace? Here in this account of the Magi, we'll see God intending to do something among us, even the Gentiles. His son will even be worshipped by those not considered his people. The Magi weren't God's people. The Magi were Gentiles. You know what the Jews call Gentiles? Dogs. Dogs. But Jesus would be worshipped even among the dogs. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Us. (laughs) We We don't understand it. Do you know you had no hope in the world? Separated from God. 
not a part of the commonwealth of Israel, a stranger to the covenant. You were aliens far removed. You had nothing but judgment waiting for you, but God. And we just hold hum. <laughs> Can you imagine what it's like to burn for eternity in hell? That's where you were going. I don't care how cute you look. That's, you were going to bust hell wide open. Bust it wide open. And God in compassion, be, that had nothing to do with you. God stepped in in your place and sent Jesus to die in your place. Wow. Here we see in this story, even Gentiles, <laughs> even Gentiles. Allowed to worship the king. Let me, let me make one more point before we, we turn to our text this morning. This is an extra point. I'm really cheating. I'm cheating a little bit because this point comes from Matthew 2, verses 13 to 23, which we didn't read. That's for next year's Christmas, Lord willing. But I, I, I want to sneak a little something from here, from, from, those, from those words. You know what happens in these verses. The holy family flees to Egypt to escape Herod, and out of Egypt God called his son. You, you know the text. One more point I want to draw to your attention is that this, this in Matthew, Matthew 2, God is telling the nation of Israel, there's someone here greater than Moses and greater than the nation itself. More important than Israel is the one who was born in the manger. This is astounding, church. Up until this point in Israel's history, the nation transcended its leadership. For it was to the nation that God had made his promises. Now with the coming of Jesus, one greater than the nation itself would be here. He would receive the promises and distribute them to whom he chooses. This is Matthew 2 is powerful. Matthew 2 is packed as God demonstrates an important phase of his plan for your life. So there are powerful messages here for God's people, both those of the time, Israel, and those who would follow the church, us. We should take note of what was going on here and give heed to the message found in these words. There will be three points Three points of which we should make note this year as we begin our study of Matthew chapter 2. Three points. They are number one, the coming of the Magi. The coming of the Magi, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Number three, sorry, number two, the controversy surrounding the Magi. The controversy surrounding the Magi, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And then number three, the commissioning of the Magi. The commissioning of the Magi. Chapter 2, verses 7 through 12. The coming, the controversy surrounding, and then the commissioning of the Magi. Today we'll focus on the first of these. The coming of the Magi. Look again at what Matthew writes in Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. We see here two things, the Magi's journey and the purpose behind their journey. The Magi's journey and the purpose 
behind their journey. It's here at church, under the first of these, verse 1, it's here in Matthew, after the birth of Jesus, that we have the first mention of anything that would allow us to date occurrences being discussed in this text. Unlike in Luke, who began his account immediately with a dating of the birth of Christ, Matthew follows the birth of Christ with his dating. In fact, it's in the opening of Matthew's mention of the Magi that we're given the, the birthplace that Jesus was, had been born in, Bethlehem of Judea, and the ruler who was in place at the time of his birth in the days of Herod the king. We already know from our previous study of Luke that, that Mary and Joseph were, were not from Bethlehem. While it was their ancestral home, it was not where they had resided. But as we saw and as we will see in the text as well, the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, not Nazareth, where the family was from. Remember, church, that to accomplish this, God imposed his will on Rome, made them do a census, and made everybody go back to their ancestral home. God moved the entire world to get his son born in the place he was supposed to be born. That's power. That's power. The ruler in Israel at this time was Herod. Now, we need to gain an understanding of the type of ruler Herod was, or you're going to miss the significance of this story entirely. So let's do a little background on King Herod. Now, many years ago, many years ago in December of 2006, I did a series of biographical sketches for you on the major figures that played a role in the birth of Jesus. I did one sermon on Mary's background. I did a second one on Joseph's background. Then in my third sermon on December 24th, I gathered the rest of the major characters, including Herod, Zacharias, and Elizabeth, that's John's parents, the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, the, who greeted him in in the, in the temple, and then finally the Magi. I, I engrouped all of those into one sermon. I want to refer to some of the things I taught you back at that time regarding Herod. So let's kind of review what we learned about this king, King Herod. We learned that Herod, who would eventually be known as Herod the Great, was the second son of Antipater the Second a man of noble origins from the Idumean region of, of Judah. He was born approximately 50 years before Jesus in 72 BC. Now, when you hear the place named Idumea, Idumea, think of Edom. Edom. You know Edom, of course, from the Old Testament. Well, Idumea used to be Edom, who were the Edomites or the Edomians, well, they were half Jews. They were half Jews. Now, at first, you might be surprised to hear of Herod being referred to as a king in Matthew. Since in the Roman Empire, there was only one king, Caesar. But Herod was king in a secondary or in a regional sense. Herod's father, Antipater II, had gained influence in Israel just before the Romans conquered them. And through ingratiating himself to Julius Caesar, Herod's father was eventually named governor of Judea. This allowed him to appoint his first son, Phasiel, to be governor of the city of Jerusalem, and his second son, Herod, to be the governor of Galilee. It was in this slot as the governor of Galilee that Herod began to demonstrate his ability to rule. And not only did he clean up Galilee and its problem with bandits, but he also proved to be an excellent collector of taxes, which Rome, of course, loved. He also was an, was an effective suppressor of revolts against Roman authority. When Julius Caesar was assassinated by Cassius and Brutus, in 44 BC, Cassius took over the region north of Herod's territory and enlisted Herod to help him raise taxes. 
At the conclusion of a bloody civil war within the Roman Empire, Herod eventually was appointed king of Judea, ascending to the throne in 37 BC, in essence becoming the king of the Jews. Herod, however, was hated by almost all the people over whom he ruled. The people, particularly the, the Pharisees, were not in support of his rule because he was a half Jew. The aristocrats resented Herod and how he came to power because he, he set aside some among their ranks who should have been rulers. Herod's methodologies in dealing with those who dissented from him was brutal and calculated. His enemies, even among his own family, he either imprisoned or executed, and those who bowed to his will, he enriched. Now, Herod experienced a number of years of peace and prosperity in the middle of his rule in which he embarked on great building projects like the temple in Jerusalem. He began the temple in 20 BC. It wasn't finished until well after his death in AD 63. Herod's temple was one of the great architectural achievements of the ancient world. But in spite of these great things, the close of his life was marked by insane, insane jealousy and suspicion. First off, Herod had 10 wives. Let, let that sink in. 10 wives and seven sons who each vied for control after he passed. The drama associated with these young men's mothers and their own self interest was legendary. Add to this Herod's sister's influence, who had a son that she wanted to rule in her uncle's place when he died. And all of this brought about perpetual tension and animosity. Within a 10-year span, the conflicts spawned six different wills from the hand of Herod the Great, with various sons or combinations of sons being appointed as his heir. Six different wills in 10 years. One of his sons, the oldest, due to his impatience, tried to kill his father. Herod would request from Rome permission to execute his son, which he did as soon as the right was granted. He killed his son because his son tried to kill him. Now, it's in the midst of this that the Magi show up and ask to see the king. Can you imagine? Herod had, Herod had just written his fourth will. And he had sent the will off to Rome for ratification. And in the fourth will that he wrote, he named his youngest son, Antipas, to be king in his place and bypassed all his older sons. And right after that will was written, these magi come in looking for the next king, but they weren't looking for Antipas. They were looking for a newborn child, the Messiah. Can you imagine the response they would have gotten when the Bible said Jerusalem was troubled? Guess what? Jerusalem was troubled. They didn't know what Herod was going to do. Herod was crazy. There was a lot of suspicion attached to these magi. Matthew noted in our text, he said, behold, magi from the east. Some translators have translated this, in the days of Herod the king, look, look, magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. The, the, this emphasizes the unexpected nature. They showed up all of a sudden out of nowhere. Well, who were these, indiv who were these individuals? Uh, throughout Christian history, many myths and legends have risen regarding these mysterious visitors. Uh, some people have even given them names. Some people claim to know where they were buried. Songs have been written about the three wise men. Do you see anywhere in the text where it says there were three of them? 
I don't see that in the Bible. We just sang about three, right? <laughs> Do you find it in the, in the text of Scripture? Nope. <laughs> Who said there were three? A lot of legends, a, 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 lot of, a lot of make-believe stuff about the three wise men. But again, I want to go back to my overview I gave you back in 2006. Who were these magi? Well, they were real people. They weren't make-believe. They were real people. Who, who were they? Let me, let me, let me give, give you a little history lesson here. Historically, we first hear about the term magi about 600 years before the birth of Christ. And, it's, and we find it as a description of one of the tribes of the ancient nation or peoples known as Media or the, the Midians. The, the Midians. Media was in eastern Mesot Mesopotamia, just north of the Persian Gulf and east of the, of the Euphrates and Tigris River. Today you know this region as Iran. This is Iran. And the, and, the, and the countries around Iran. Eventually, this term magi was used to describe a member of a hereditary priesthood, not only in Midia, but in other Iranian people groups throughout this entire region. This caste of priests functioned in normative priestly fashion. They made sacrifices and all those type of things. However, this group of priests became known in the ancient world for their supposed ability to interpret special signs, often astronomical signs or astrological signs. In common usage, the term magi also referred to the belief that they that these people had supernatural knowledge or ability. Not only did they aid the dead in their transition to the afterlife, but the ability to interpret dreams was also attributed to the, to the Magi. Related to their practices, they in, involved the, the occult and sorcery. These practices led to the description of the, of the Magi by some as magicians magicians. In fact, you might recognize the word magic and magicians as a form of magi. The uh, Greek word here is, is magos, from which we get magic and magician. The magi were basically monotheistic in their religious worship. They worshiped one god, and their religious movement was known as Zoroastrianism. I should have put a slide up there. I'm sorry I didn't. Just look up Z-O-R and you'll find it. Zoroastrianism was part of the religious life of Persia, Persia, the twin country of Midia. Darius the Great, who's mentioned in the Bible, by the way, established this religion as the official religion of the empire when, they, when he unified, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the nations of Midia and Persia unified to become one nation, one kingdom. This religion focused upon the god named Ahura Mazda and spoke of him as the creator. It included a universal conflict in which their God eventually won and advocated man's free choice to perform good deeds, thoughts, and words. The Magi studied and amassed a tremendous amount of information in various areas of human knowledge, and they became highly sought as both teachers and educators of both philosophers and kings alike. Their role garnered them the description as the wise men. They were known as the wise men. Because of their role as teachers, even of kings, they wielded tremendous influence in the halls of power in the Midian nation. However, when Midia and Persia were, were united in, in 550 BC under Cyrus, aka Darius, the Magi later revolted against his son, and as a result, they lost their prestige, but they continued. So that's the historical background. We see the influence of the Magi in certain Old Testament books, especially in the book of Daniel. However, we do have a couple of mentions of the Magi in Jeremiah 39. Jeremiah 39. 
In this chapter, Jeremiah records the capture of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he had been in siege against the city for 30 months. In the 30th month, they finally break through the walls and they take over Jerusalem. In 39 verse 3, it records that the officials of King Nebuchadnezzar took their seat at the middle gate. And this signified their dominion over the city and that they were going to judge the inhabitants who, had, who, had they, who, had they, who they had taken captive. One of the officials that Nebuchadnezzar brought with him was a man named Nergalzer Ezer. Nergalzer Ezer. And this is how the Bible describes him in Jeremiah 39, verse 13. The Bible calls him the Rab Mag. The Rab Mag. If you look at the notes in your Bible, what you see is that the Rab Mag is the chief of the Magi. The chief of the Magi. He was the one who was over the Magi in Babylon. The biblical depiction of the Magi receives most of its content, however, from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Turn there. In, in the book of Daniel, we see the intent of, of Nebuchadnezzar to isolate the best of the Hebrew slaves who, according to Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, showed intelligence in every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. In order to serve, verse 4 says that they would be taught the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now, we get some idea of what these boys could do Daniel and his friends in verse 17 of chapter 1. It says, and as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and influence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Their skills were obvious for chapter 1 verse 20 says, and as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. Now, who were these magicians and conjurers? Who, who were these group of people? Well, these gifts given to Daniel and his friends by God were displayed for the reader for the first time in chapter 2 of Daniel. In 2, the king had a dream, and he wanted the dream interpreted. Those to whom he looked to interpret it were recorded in, in Daniel 2, verse 2. Listen to how they're described. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came in and stood before the king. Well, you know the story. The king didn't trust these guys. So he said, you need to tell me both what I dreamed and then its interpretation. They, get a, they have a fight with them. They say, king, look, nobody asks wise men to tell them the dream. You tell us the dream, we'll interpret it. He said, I don't trust you guys. Tell me the dream and the interpretation. I'm going to kill all y'all. <laughs> well, they, they, can't, they can't tell him what the dream is. So he begins to kill them. And, the, and his guard goes and finds Daniel to kill Daniel. Daniel, what you killing me for? He then describes to Daniel what's going on. Now, Listen to verse 13 as it describes the decree to kill all these wise men, all these, all these men, excuse me. Daniel 2, verse 13. So the, so the decree went forth that the, who? The wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Now, what we have here is that not only was the entire group of individuals referred to as the wise men, 
But notice in your text, saints, that Daniel and his friends were considered among their ranks. They were also part of the wise men. These are the magi. These are the magi, which indicates the breadth of this group and the varied nature of their practices and disciplines. Daniel pleaded on their behalf in verse 24, asking for them to be spared. But not only this, he was later, after giving an accurate interpretation, elevated over the wise men. Look at verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect, listen, over all the wise men of Babylon. The relationship between Daniel and the wise men was solidified. When you grasp these things, you begin to see how in the world people from Babylon, the east, could wind up in Jerusalem looking for the Messiah. They had a connection with the prophet Daniel. Let's look quickly at the Magi's purpose. That's, that's their background. Why were they there? Why did they come to Jerusalem? Our text says, Matthew 2, verse 2, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. They arrived in Jerusalem because they were looking for the Messiah, the king of the Jews. Where would, where would this have come from? Most people argue, and I, I agree with them, it's, it's, it's their link with Daniel. They had a familiarity with the prophetic ministry of Daniel. When you go to Daniel, what you find is that in Daniel, you have the dating of the Messiah's birth. It's in Daniel. Many of the Old Testament books, in fact, have explicit references to the Messiah and his coming. These Gentile wise men from the area of Babylon looking for the coming of the Jewish Messiah is not as crazy as it might seem on the surface. Their appearance in Jerusalem actually makes perfect sense. You might say, well, why didn't they go to Bethlehem? Well, they didn't know about Bethlehem. Well, why Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the capital. What was the capital of the Jewish people? Jerusalem. Where else would you go? If you're looking for a king. If you're looking for the king of the Jews, you go to the place that's the, and everybody knew in the ancient world, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. And so they show up in Jerusalem and they're just going around to everybody, ask, where's the king? Where's the baby who was just born who is king? Where is he? Their assumption was the king was there in Jerusalem and he would eventually begin ruling from the capital of Israel. But the text says everybody got troubled. Everybody got troubled. Listen to why they got trouble. Listen to the words of these guys. I mean, the words are critical. First off, they're asking for the one born king. The idea here, church, is not so much one born to be king, but the idea is really they're looking for the born king. The born king. This is a direct and emphatic reference to his genealogical right to the throne. This is the king by birthright. This stands in direct contrast to Herod, who was, who was a usurper to the throne. He was the true heir of the throne of the Jewish people. They, they knew to come because they saw his star in the east. This phrase, in the east, in the Greek text, should better be translated as follows. We saw his star in its rising. The, 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 the phrase in the east literally is in its rising. They saw his star in its rising. In other words, 
the wording here is not regarding the place that they saw it or the place that the star was, but that it, it arose and with its rising, they set out on their journey. So they come to Jerusalem and say, we want to see the born king. Where's the born king? And we know he's the born king because we saw a star arise and the star was connected to his birth. It's clear that they're not talking about Antipas, Herod's youngest son. It's clear. And so everybody was troubled. Those who supported Herod were troubled. Those who didn't support Herod were troubled thinking Herod's going to kill us. The whole city was on edge at the coming of these magi. Now, now, the Bible doesn't tell us what they saw. Let's be honest. It says a star, but what does that mean? Was a new planet created? I mean, I guess it's possible. What, what, what's, what's going on here? Various solutions have been offered. Uh, you know, it was a comet, or it was, a, it was an eclipse, or, you know, what, what exactly was it? Well, what no, what no solution tells us is, why would they associate what they saw with the Messiah? That's the question. If you just saw a star pop up in the heavens, you say, oh, must be the Messiah. <laughs> really? Th that's your conclusion? How? How does that happen? What's going on here, I would argue, has got to be supernatural. Something supernatural is taking place here, probably a supernatural event of some form, and God somehow is connecting with the wise men and indicating this is messianic, head out. What else are you going to argue? People don't see heavenly bodies and all of a sudden conclude the Messiah is here. What we do know for sure is this. They appeared in Jerusalem intending to find the born king who had now entered the world. And what did they want to do when they found the born king? They wanted to worship him. This word worship here means to bow or to prostrate yourself. We might refer to this as obeisance. It was, it was a physical display of respect and homage. Throughout the biblical literature, we, 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 we see bowing offered to people of higher and social standing, as in the case when Ruth bowed to, to, to Boaz in Ruth chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, not as a slave, but as somebody who received a gift from somebody of higher standing. In Exodus 18, we see Moses bow to his father-in-law because his father-in-law had a higher filial rank in the family than Moses. We could go on and talk about David bowing to Saul, 1 Samuel 24, verse 8. Abigail bowing to David, uh, 1 Samuel 25, verse 41. A soldier bowing to his military commander, 2 Samuel 18, verse 21. But you get this idea. This, this idea of bowing was an idea of, of respect and homage, and it became a religious reference to worship. Worship. As king, they were going to recognize him for his position. The implication of this for Matthew and his readers was that Jesus was more than just a king. As the wise men desired to worship him, and eventually did, later, during his earthly ministry, many would bow and worship him, and eventually, even at his resurrection, he is worshiped as the risen Lord in Matthew 28, verses 9 and 17. That is the response. That's the proper response on Christmas, is to worship Jesus. Christ's coming into the world brought with it gifts for us, yes, I admit that. But what Christ's coming in the world did is it caused people to respond in worship.
to this great and awesome king. I hope that Christmas means worship of Jesus for you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this account of the Magi today. In a world that has so secularized Christmas and it's made it about trees and lights and wreaths and presents. We're reminded this morning that ultimately it's about worshiping the king. Jesus <laughs> is the point of Christmas. I know the world doesn't recognize it, Lord, but we do. I know the world doesn't acknowledge it, but we do. I know the world wants to pour us into its mold regarding Christmas. They tell us it's all about family traditions. No, it's about Jesus. They tell us it's about presents. No, it's, it's about Jesus. They tell us, tell us it's about getting together with each other. No, it's, it's about Jesus. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us not to lose sight of the true significance and purpose of recognizing your son's birth is to worship him. And let us worship him as he has prescribed for worship to be, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please move, keep, please keep the moving to a minimum as we prepare at this time for the Lord's table. Ask the elders who are assisting to come forth at this time as we ready ourselves to celebrate the death of Christ.